Well, g'day everyone. Lee Blackall here again in the lead up to the Blended Learning and Online Teaching Conference on the 1st of November and one of our panellists will be Ed Lay. Ed Lay teaches sports physiotherapy and he's a, um, a lecturer in the Masters of Mo Musculoskeletal and Sports Physiotherapy and a coordinator of postgraduate musket masters. Um, and we'll be interviewing Ed about um, a multimedia resource that he developed uh, for the MRI for the lumbar spine, a physiotherapy perspective. So I take it, Ed, that's a, um, that's a subject that you run in the course? Or um, is that a module? It's a, it's, it's a component of one subject within the course. Okay. okay. So, well, talk us through it. I mean, uh, uh, mo as with the case with most uh, resource developments in the university, you usually have to win a grant of some sort, a small amount of money to apply to this sort of thing. Is that the case for you or did your department have the money or did you just volunteer um, your time? The, the department, um, the, fac the Faculty of Health Sciences were sort of saying that they had some, some money to, to develop some online resources and so they um, put the call out and I answered that call and said, yep, we've got some ideas about some things we could do to take things from being face-to-face -face learning to being more of an online learning okay. in terms of content and delivery. So, well, um, then, okay. Well, tell so us about that context. What was, what was that face-to-face -face setting? Why did you think it would transfer into an online setting yeah. well? And So within the Masters of Musculoskeletal and Sports program, we have one subject which is a two-week intensive where we have our students coming. It's the only time they come into university, actually, because most of our course is done online and external. Um, we sort of have links with external organisations. Um, so they come in for two weeks intensive and we usually fly um, or bring in content experts into the university to teach these people because they're high level physios who who need that um, high level sort of, um, they want to hear from people who are very, very experienced and are very, very skilled. So um, one of the problems that we had been having is that sometimes people would get sick and they'd have to cancel, so our students would miss out. Um, the other problem would be they'd only get two hours of this expert's time and then you know, they'd be madly writing notes and then they'd have no way of reviewing that. Um, and sometimes we couldn't get, um, say, the Western Lecture Theatre so we could record the actual, uh, the actual interaction that they had. So what we wanted to do was try and take some of those face-to-face um, -face interactions and put them into a online learning environment and try and mimic the workshop environment that Rob sort of set up, who's the presenter for our MRI, um, I guess, component of the course, if that makes sense. So what we wanted to do was take a two-hour workshop and put that into an online environment and make it as interactive as possible and um, get the students doing things rather than just listening, I guess. And so how did you approach it? You, you, you had an idea already yeah. what that online resource would look like or did you consult with people or what, how did you approach it? Yes, yeah, so we had a, a bit of an idea of what we would do and then I guess we did, um, we were asked to liaise with some educational consultants with regards to it, um, which was pretty much just confirming, yes, what you're doing sounds fine. Um, I originally had about five things I wanted to do and I was advised to limit it to one thing. So I guess they were good in terms of making sure I honed down what we wanted to do. Um, so, sorry, I can't remember what the question was, well, but what we did... Okay. No, you're on track, you're on track. Sort of, how did you approach it? So, you, so that the consultants. So we saw the consultants and went from there. Um, and then from that we had an um, external person helping us actually develop the resource in terms of the filming. Um, another external person who was an animator um, who was helping us with some animations, um, which were both uh, moving images but also fixed images. And we also had the external um, content presenter, I guess, um, okay. who was the expert in the field. But before you got those three external producers and presenters in, you must have had a fairly clear idea what it is you were asking them to do and produce. So in um, media production terms, this would be called a script or a treatment and script. Did you have to go down that path? Did you have to script it all out precisely exactly as you wanted it before the producers came in? Yeah, we did have a pretty good script of what we wanted to do. Um, it was based around what Rob usually did in terms of his presentations anyway. And so it was mimicking his PowerPoint presentations and his, I guess, um, gaps where he was asking people to sort of do things. 
Um, yeah. So there was a, there was a script which we did use, um, and I had a bit of an idea of how I wanted to put it online. I guess um, we had a few ideas which we came up with in terms of trying to make things more engaging for the students, um, such as Rob as he was presenting and pointing out things on the MRI, we had a vision of him sort of being like a, a weather announcer and having him stand in front of a blue screen, but as he was doing pointing to different parts of an MRI and different structures and then explaining that to the students, but we decided that was a bit too complicated. So we, we ended up making it much more simpler than what we were planning to do. But we did have a... Go ahead. Sorry? Here you go. All right. Well, I mean, uh, looking at the uh, notes you've put in for the conference, you've... Um, it, so it looks like you've produced... Ten mini lectures of is it, what's his name, Rob. So you've basically taken what would normally be a what was it a two-hour lecture or a one-hour lecture at that face-to-face -face conference, and you've asked him to chunk it into ten little items of same sort of format, though lecturing that format. But then you've packed um, other items around it: a pre-reading relevant to the topic, um, a PDF version of the PowerPoint that he uses through those ten stuff like that. Is that right? That's correct. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and the, and I guess the way that we did it is that rather than just him talking, we had him he would, did a bit of an intro, and then talked about um, a certain image of an MRI, and then he would say he had a picture of an MRI with um, labels on the different structures on that particular image, and then students were asked to go away and have a think about it and actually have a go at labeling those different structures themselves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they could compare what they thought to what Rob thought in the subsequent sort of uh, mini lecture, I guess, as we went through. So it was it, sort of like show a bit, they did a bit, and then come back and compare what they thought to what the expert thought. I think I've got a picture in my head, so, but this might be putting you a bit on the spot, though, Ed. Uh, you know how to use the screen share feature in Hangouts. Would you be able to bring up a quick view of it on your screen? Um. <laughs> might take a little bit of mucking around. Right. -o. Well, you know, um, I mean, other things to think about is, um, as you'd go about doing that, if you can multitask, yeah. is I'm wondering, did you have to negotiate any kind of um, IP contract, an intellectual property contract or a copyright agreement with the presenter and the producers of the um, media content? Uh, going into this, or uh, how is that kind of stuff handled? The um, I guess the Lynn Matheson um, dealt with the people who were filming, the actual filmers and the animators, or the company that was organising that. So we, I didn't have anything to do with that. With the person who was the content presenter, um, we did look at perhaps having a. Um, some sort of contract, but what we ended up doing is he agreed to come on as a casual, and all the contractual requirements as, as a casual came into it. So well, that's, um, a, that's a good approach. That probably made it all much simpler, actually, rather than draw up new contracts or anything. Bring them in as a casual. They're then subject to the terms and conditions of a Latrobe employee. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. So that's the way we went around it. So um, it wasn't what we planned to do. It just ended up being simpler that way. So yeah. Okay. Rob was. So generous with his time and his knowledge, I guess he was happy to do that. We were very fortunate to have Rob. Does he have the rights to use the content as well, or is this exclusive use to La Trobe and it's embedded in your courses online? Um, our understanding is that he does have the rights to continue using it. It is his sort of material that he's developed initially. So um, in terms of using our animations, um, with which he's sort of um, used with, giving him okay to do that as long as he acknowledges Latrobe. Um, and we see that as being a promotional thing for Latrobe as well, as he might be doing presentations for separate courses or perhaps for conferences. And so he can use our animations and and with the Latrobe brand on it, which um, I think is is good promotion for the course. And I also noticed in your notes the biggest challenge in this production was managing the production team, you know, keeping everyone on the same page. Uh, tell us yeah. a bit about that. I mean, yeah, um, there was, I, I underestimated the amount of time it would take to, um, I guess, 
work with external film people who perhaps weren't as experienced as I expected. Um, so that was a learning experience for me. Um, and also with the animator as well, I found that they were, they almost talk a bit like a different language. It's sort of like if you get your bathroom re renovated and you have some tradies coming through, they, they speak a different language and you might think you're being clear to them, but you often aren't because you're not speaking quite the way they do. So someone like an animator I found, you know, I could type as many emails as I wanted to until I actually saw them face to face and, and spoke to them and drew pictures, they didn't really get what we were sort of talking about. And I guess a similar sort of thing with the film people was sort of like um, speaking to them face to face was much more effective and efficient than trying to, I guess, coordinate things via email. Mm. So I think that was rather tricky for me. And then we had the external content provider as well. So I found it difficult to find times when everyone was available. Um, places where everyone could get to at certain times and we ended up going, having to go to the uh, animator who was down in St Kilda because they weren't portable so they didn't have animation, um, the, the stuff that they were doing with the animations were very, um, had to be done on a high power computer so they couldn't do it on their laptop so I had to go down to them. And I guess similar sort of things with the editing of the actual film. So that sort of stuff I found rather challenging. And no doubt it would have been a lot more work than you expected going into it, you know, that travel time, going back to meetings, all that sort of stuff. Absolutely. Mm. Absolutely. And well, I guess... Mm. Here you go. We've got a bit of a lag, so it's making it difficult. But uh, just reflecting on that, what you know now in the process, what would you do differently through that process? I mean, we see a lot of DIY approaches where lecturers are recording their own lectures, such as through this Hangout tool and mixing it up on, I don't know, whatever, YouTube or stuff like that. I mean, have you given any consideration to that comparing to the uh, professionally produced um, process you've been through? Yeah, I think um, the valuable stuff that I learned from it was the animators. I think um, when you start putting things online and recorded, it's a different copyright requirements to if you um, are just presenting face to face in a lecture. Mm -hmm. So I guess people tend to just take, you know, take things from the internet and just acknowledge where they got them from, but you can't really just do that, is my understanding, if you do it via um, recording something online. So I guess one thing that I've learnt is that using animators is a good thing, and I think we should have a bank of animations which we can use for certain presentations, um, which can be reused. But in terms of just doing the filming, I think doing it online with um, screen capture technology and um, the do-it-yourself sort of modules, as you're sort of talking about, I think that's probably the way to go. I, I don't really think having a high-quality film product is going to transmit the information any more interestingly than, um, in this case anyway, mm. than um, doing it with the do-it-yourself sort of model. Mm. Yeah. Okay, good, yeah. good. That, that makes sense? So, yeah. yeah, no, that's a good interesting uh, perspective on it. I mean, two parts to it is that I assume the animation is rich in its description of the thing that you're trying to explain and to produce animation still requires significant level of expertise to manage that software and a powerful computer to render it, etc. Uh, but also, interestingly, it's uh, you see it as a more efficient way to get around com copyright complexity. So there might be an animation out there already that does it, but it's restricted in copyright. You can't use it in this format, uh, so it makes sense to get someone in to create one for you, and then you put it out there. Okay, good one. Absolutely. And I guess had, um, hmm. when we did do actual filming, it was all done in one take. We didn't have to do lots of takes, so because the person was an experienced presenter. So um, I guess the editing that you require was minimal. Um, was okay. sort of things at the front, taking things at the end. The only other advantage was putting a, a watermark on, which I don't know how to do, um, which would be a useful thing to learn. But I can't imagine it would be that too hard to put a watermark on, no, you know, and putting the no brand onto an actual, um, on, onto a, uh, a screen capture thing. <laughs> For those watching, you're probably, hang on, I a point, you're probably watching the recording, or we do have one viewer of the webcast, as it turns out, hello you, uh, that's a watermark up there, that Google icon you can see at the top, uh, Google, and it's infinite generosity, still manages to label us as Google product, thank you very <laughs> much. How'd you go, Ed, did you get the screen up, can we have a look at uh, something here, or... Okay. 
Yeah, yeah. Um, hold on. No, I'm just getting lost now. Just give me a minute. Okay. Now I'm assuming that you present this to students through the Latrobe Learning Management System, which is Moodle. Is this how people yeah, access yeah. and see this? Okay. So accessing, they're required to become a student, of course. Uh, then they're given access to the subject, and then they navigate through to the subject. Okay. Uh, you can see my screen. I can. I'm looking at myself. Looking at myself. Now yeah. we're good. Okay. Can you see that now? We can. Right. So this is. Um, we're just trialling this at this point in time. We're hoping that in the future, I'll we'll be able to get some specific feedback about how students have found it. And what I'm really interested in is, you know, do they find this just as valuable as doing a face-to-face -face sort of um, teaching? And what we've done is. Only two people have actually done this trial, and they said it was actually better than what they, um, in terms of the learning experience, than having the face-to-face -face lecture. Oh, they that's very encouraging. Was, yeah, it was only two people, very small sample, um, but um, they were they they really enjoyed it, and they thought it was quite a valuable way to learn. Um, so if you have a look through, uh, we just have a bit of an intro about what is required for the module. This is a very basic setup. I might look at making it a little bit fancier in the future, um, just going through the different parts of it. Um, we have the recommended reading, which is written down here. Scroll yeah, down to actual it, online. Can I just, sorry yeah. to interrupt you there, can you press Control plus on your keyboard, just zoom us in a little bit there so we can see better what you're looking at. How's that? Uh, I've got a, it's a bit better, maybe one more or two more times. One more? Yeah, that's getting better. Uh, yeah. That's good. Okay, I know it reduces it down a fair bit, but we can certainly see the words now. All Thanks, right. Ed. On you go. No worries. So part one is just the recommended reading, which we have. The second part is the actual lectures, which we have here, um, which are broken up into five ten-minute chunks. My initial idea was to have a little quiz after the end of each little section, so students could check that they've actually achieve the learning outcomes that we um, want them to achieve, just like a multiple, chair, multiple choice um, question. Um, the idea was to make it like a flag race, so they'd actually um, look at some images and have a go at labelling certain things. I found that that's actually quite time consuming. It took me, I think, three hours just to do ten questions like that, so God. I've sort of failed on that idea for now, yeah. but might revisit it in the future. Um, so what we've done is it there's quite a few little, I guess, mini lectures through here, and then we have the flag race at the end, which is just um, the little questionnaire we have. And then, of course, having a little discussion forum at the end where students can um, bounce ideas off each other, ask if they've ask each other if they've got any questions. Um, and what I find with these discussion forums at this level with this particular student cohort, they tend to answer their own questions. Oh, that's good. That yep. like, yeah. Well, give us a look All at right. one of the mini lectures, uh, part one. Uh, pop that one open for us. Um, or whichever part, part one. you think. Part one's a bit boring. I might go down and do something a bit more. Yeah, we'll do part one. Especially give on us now. a look at one of those animations you were you were saying. Or, um, oh, okay. Well, we won't do part one then. So if we can find probably the patho anatomy. The discarnation would be on there. Let's look at this. So what we did do is we ended up putting it on the library um, website, yep. just so we could have greater control over who sort of accessed it. Um, so what's that library service just for lecturers in Latrobe thinking about this? Where, who do they see? What unit do they see in the library to um, uh, get this set up? I can't actually remember. Lynn Matheson actually directed me to the correct person, but they were fantastic. They actually were able to do a little bit of editing as well in terms of putting things at the front and at the end of um, each of the lectures. Um, when I did the editing, I forgot to put the references at the end of each of it with um, the external um, film editor, um, but when I took that to the library, they were very helpful and were able to do that for me. So um, they were able to do some minor editing, but they're not able to do some other major sort of stuff. Okay. It's just chopping and changing things. It's, it's not too bad. But there was it was a very simple and easy. It was the easiest part of the process, mm -hmm. and the quickest part. So I, I might just mute. now, if you press play, uh, just need to explain to viewers that uh, you're at home 
using up your bandwidth in this video conference where you're in Hangouts. But yep. I'll eat my words. There it is coming straight on through. So that's great. I was expecting a bit of a delay there. Yep. So that's not too bad. So this is Rob. Disk Disk. Yeah, good one. Right there in the in the uh, office. Well, he's got my authenticity badge on. I like that. Good. I was expecting him in a big lecture theatre behind a lectern looking all official. Are you still with us, Ed? Can you hear me? Oh my god. What's happened? Seem to have frozen up. Ah, no. All right. Look, I think uh, we might have to end this broadcast. We didn't get to see a um, animation. Uh, but maybe we'll follow up with a quick part two. Just stand by. Uh, well, we're back. Sorry about that, Ed. I should have known that running a pretty large video file like that, as well as the Hangout, might crash a, a little computer like your home jobby. So sorry, Ed. Um, but we won't run that again. We, we did get a quick look at it. Just I had a question about that video. Um, does the animation feature in the video, or is that a separate file that that people look at? It's with, it's embedded within the actual um, within the actual video. So the way we did it is it, it was basically a simple um, screen capture. Is the way we sort of use embedded it. I guess we embedded the actual animation into a PowerPoint presentation, and then um, and then did it that way. So it wasn't. Yeah, it was it was basically just a, a spine which is spinning around and then um, you can sort of make the bones of the spine actually become more I guess how do we make it we made them so they were transparent so you could actually see the disc material underneath and see what was happening within the actual disc so it was yeah it sounds pretty simple but it took a little while to sort of put together mm. but it helps make it a little bit more engaging and a little bit more interesting mm. it helps the clarity of um, explanation for the presenter so, closing now, I'd say the in terms of the question or the panel discussion about producing educational media, your closing remarks is that a team of media producers may not speak, probably won't speak the same language as an educational person. Yep. So getting, getting understanding of what you're trying to achieve will be a challenge. Then coordinating everyone's time uh, to achieve the end product will be a challenge. And uh, finally, in terms of your project, you saw great value in producing the animations because uh, it got around copyright issues. We're producing original content and it illustrated complex uh, things. But when it came to recording the lecture, it may or may not be worth getting a professional video production to record that lecture versus just recording the lecture with, uh, um, I don't know, a, an iPhone and a good microphone or something like that. Or in the case, you, you, sorry, uh, you, you'd set someone up in the office, so you know you are sitting in a home office there. You know you could be giving a lecture yeah. straight down the webcam right now. I think that would be just as valuable um, as for this particular sort of topic. I think there's other things that would be useful to film things. I think mm -hmm. filming, but not yeah, this okay. particular this particular um, project that we we're doing. All right, Ed. Well, thanks very much for talking to us. Will you be coming along on the first of November to the uh, to the panel conference discussing various areas of blended learning online teaching? Absolutely, planning to be there. Okay. Looking forward to it. Oh, good. Thanks very much for coming. Thanks for meeting us on here and giving us a little show through. Sorry about the crash, but it was good to see you online, Ed, and give us a little intro oh. to your work. Okay, you. I'll just hand, I'll end the broadcast. Stand by, Ed. We'll we'll say our goodbyes personally. Thanks everyone right. for watching.